Hello world, in the beginning games looked like this, just text, like an interactive story, you typed in the commands, the game wrote its text in response, all the graphics appeared in your head, you had to have imagination. Once computers became more powerful though, games could become visual, and our reaction times are now the challenge of the game. These early games were often restricted to just being one screen though, and the backgrounds consisted of very simple plain colours all were completely absent. Over time, games evolved to use more than one screen, making the world seem larger. Backgrounds became more detailed. And eventually, we figured out how to scroll the screen to make a continuous world to play around in. All of this was quite difficult for computers of the time to manage. They weren't powerful enough to move large screen sized images around. So they cheated. By treating the screen as a big grid, and then use pieces of images called tiles to create the display. Today we're looking at how this type of tile map system was implemented and then I'm going to use that knowledge to make my own tile map system for the Aegon Light. If you take an NES game like this one with everyone's favourite plumber and you look at the screen, it's pretty obvious it's been broken down into individual tiles. The repetition is easy to see. This isn't just some stylistic hipster choice. Retro games look this way on purpose because of how the hardware worked. Let's see what's going on inside this machine to understand why it looks this way. So I'm running this game in an emulator. This one is aimed at developers and it allows you to see what's happening in the machine. Like, I can call up bits of screen that tell me extra things about the machine. So, each part of the screen relates to a specific tile in the tile set. If I bring up a certain window, I can see what the tiles look like. So here you can see all the graphics. This is all bits of Mario. This bit down here is all the numbers and text. So all this player game and Mario and this score and everything, that's all built up from these little pieces here. And then these blocks down here, this is the rest of the screen. So you can see it's like these bumpy green things, which is these, um, I was going to say clouds, but that's because they're actually bushes. But let's watch the screen scroll across in a minute and you'll spot something. I mean, now if you probably know this already, it's not a big secret. Look, there, cloud. Looks the same as a bush. They've reused the graphics. This is an advantage of using tiles. You don't need separate graphics for everything. This tube here, it's all built up from like two or three different tiles repeated. This is kind of what I'm trying to learn how to do. Now the interesting thing about this system is you need a way of building this up. This screen needs somehow creating. So if I open this part of the emulator, you can literally see it happen. Now the demo is not very interesting. So if I just grab a controller. Okay, so I've got my totally fake Super Nintendo pad that's plugged into my PC. And I can run around with little Mario. If you look at the other screen though, you better see how the level is built up. And I always die on that first frigging Goomba. I do not like this game very much. It's too difficult. So here we are. If we run along the screen, go on you fat plumber, let's get moving. You can see in the side window how it draws each part as the screen scrolls across. And we'll fall down the hole and that'll do. This is not a let's play of Mario. So the way this works is all very logical and it's easy to follow. In the game's ROM is a big list of tile indices and the game code uses that to know which tiles to put on the screen. Last week I figured out how to draw bitmaps to the screen of my Aegon. A tile map shouldn't be too hard, it's just an extension of the basic idea. Let's see if we can figure this out. First we need a set of tile graphics. I'm going to use this one from the Kenny Assets website, mostly because I like the art style. The fact it's black and white only is irrelevant. The Aegon can draw colour, but we've got some decent tiles here that we can play with. I need to save that as an image, but then I need to convert it into the RGBA2222 format like we did last week, but we've got some tools that we can run this through to do that for us. A tile map is nothing special, it's just an array. So we'll make one of 8-bit integers and store tile IDs inside it that will cover the screen. Drawing the tiles is easy, it's just a nested for loop. And inside this nested for loop is a call to plot the relevant bitmap using its tile ID. There you go, job done, simple tile engine, thanks for watching, like, share, subscribe.
Not quite. I want to make a scrolling tile map. It should be possible to explore more world than is visible on the screen. Also, as we'll discover shortly, there's a severe problem with how we're drawing this tile map. It won't actually work in a game. But first, scrolling tile maps. How do they even work? If we go back to what is becoming our benchmark, the NES, their tile maps could move smoothly. It seems important being able to do that. Games got a lot better when there's more off the screen to discover. One of the defining characteristics of a good game was that it took up more space than a single screen. It somehow like captures your imagination a bit more if you can't see the entire game in one go. This seems like it would require a lot of hard work and doing it properly does, as we're gonna discover. But first let's figure out what the general algorithm for scrolling a tile map should even be. Just how do we move all the tiles sideways and how do we have more of them to see when we've moved them across? Well, the cheap way is to do what hundreds of Unity and Unreal Engine tutorials tell you to do and simply draw the entire level onto the game world and then just pan the in-game camera across it. This relies on modern hardware being fast enough that doing this doesn't cause any problems. That kind of thing isn't going to work on our tiny little 8-bit machine. We just don't have the CPU power to draw things that aren't going to be seen. It's just too wasteful of CPU time. There is a better way though. Let me give you a visual demonstration of what we're trying to achieve by using the NES and this emulator that lets us see behind the scenes. So we want to do the same thing as Mario, where as he gets to the edge of the screen, the screen can scroll sideways, but we need more screen to look at. So what the NES does is it actually has effectively two screens worth of information and it can move this sliding window over those two screens worth of information. So the part that we can see is inside this white rectangle. The bit outside it is then just filled in by the code just quickly enough that it looks like a continuous scrolling thing. There's a clever bit in the NES where it's able to wrap this scrolling window around the edges of like its double width of display. What we're going to do is a simpler version. We're just going to have an extra tiles width of information at the side of the screen. And then we're going to move our own pretend sliding window across that. And once we've got to the edge of that, we're then going to reset everything and redraw the screen. It's one of those things where it's a bit easier to show you it working than to try and explain it. Doing this on the Aegon makes use of its built-in ability to scroll the screen by using a VDU command. If we send this sequence to the VDP, it will move the screen sideways by however many pixels. Before that, I can put in our double nested for loop from before, slightly modified to take into account screen dimensions. And then afterwards, add in code to draw the missing strip of tiles. And it works, and the novelty of it working might just be enough, but it's not exactly speedy, is it really? I saw this and I was amazed it works, but also a little bit disappointed. It works okay, but it's not great. You often get this in programming. It's a bit of a dead end. It's one of those local maximum things. This algorithm works, but it's not the best, and we can't refine it to be any better. This is as good as it's gonna get. I'm gonna to need to rewrite it to make it better. I have a few benchmarks in my head that I compare my code to. For ZX Spectrum, can play OutRun with decent scrolling, and a BBC Micro can play Elite, and you can run Doom on a pregnancy test. My code can be better. It shouldn't be this slow. I'm somehow doing something wrong. So let's do better. Remember, this is being done on an ESP32 microcontroller that doesn't know it's drawing video. All it's doing is processing some data and spraying cleverly timed voltages out the GPIO pins. And the voltages coming out those pins look like a VGA signal to the monitor. If anything in this is even slightly out of sync, the monitor won't understand it's a picture. And yet this works. Nothing knows it's drawing graphics is really clever. And don't worry, at some point in the future, I'll decide it might be fun to see exactly how an ESP32 does VGA. I like understanding that kind of fundamentals. And fundamentally, the tile drawing is slowing the entire code down. Except that's the bit we care about, we kind of can't get rid of that bit. So we need to do a bit of lateral thinking. So far we've been doing this the fairly simple brute force way, relying on the hardware to make up for our inefficient algorithm. 
If we think laterally, there's a few optimizations we can still make, but they'll introduce problems that we'll have to solve. But here's a crazy thought. What if we didn't draw all the screen? In fact, what if we didn't erase the screen every frame either? Because think about it. Every single frame, we're stamping tiles on the screen. So the screen is being covered up anyway. We don't need to waste time clearing pixels if new ones have been written over the top. And if we can get rid of double buffering, we're only using that to hide the partially drawn screen anyway. So let's give this a go, see if it even works. Inside the main loop of the game is a call to clear the screen and to flip the buffers. Well, let's not have double buffering, and let's not clear the screen. Okay, so we get weird smeary effects from anything moving. That's not great, but it's faster, and it proves that there are small things we can do in the code that have a big benefit. Here's another crazy idea. What if we don't redraw the whole screen every frame? The smeary oddness is because I'm repeatedly stamping the sprite on the screen, and the trail is caused by the screen being scrolled sideways. The pixels we've drawn persist until they go off the screen edge. We don't have to keep redrawing them all the time for them to stay on the screen. So let's think up a new way of doing this. What about we do the following thing? Draw the whole screen once at the start, then in a loop we need to simply scroll the screen sideways, draw the new right hand pixels, somehow deal with that smeary weirdness, and then we're done. This should work. But how do we fix the weird smeary stuff? Let's go figure it out a bit. Back in the early days of graphical computing, mice were introduced, along with graphical user interfaces. You know what's not good? Redrawing the whole screen just because the user is wiggling their mouse around. There's something about a mouse and a mouse pointer, it just invites us to wiggle the thing around the screen. In fact, if you're still watching, wiggle yours down to the subscribe button if you've not already clicked it. You're quite far into a very technical video and you're still watching. This video is your kind of thing. Avoiding drawing the whole screen can be done with a technique known as dirty rectangles. It's quite a simple concept. I'll show you using a drawing program that deliberately doesn't have layers. Now suppose I've got our player, or in my case my logo, and I want to place it on the screen. If I just stamp that image, Everything that I've just covered up is now gone. I can't get it back. So before I do that, I need to copy that region of screen that I'm about to alter and paste it somewhere safe. Now I can put on our image over the top and it doesn't matter that we've damaged it because I can cover it back up again as if it was never there. Doing it with code is a lot easier than trying to do it pixel perfect with a mouse. And now I can move things around the screen just by repeating this little process of copying the section of screen I'm about to use, pasting the sprite on top of it, and then when I need to move it, covering it back up with the piece I've just copied. And I repeat that. And if I repeat it at like 30 times a second, it looks like something is moving. There's various optimizations that can be done to capture as few pixels as possible and to handle overlapping areas being drawn to. And obviously, because I'm doing it in code, it'll be pixel perfect. But this is a game on an 8-bit machine, not a GUI in an operating system. So there's some tolerance if like, it doesn't look as good as it should do. And by using dirty rectangles with the previous code, we arrive at this. Which, by the way, is not the most efficient code, so there might be a better way to do the same thing. However, there is a pretty clever trick going on that starts when the game is initialized. Let's see what's happening with this code. First we draw the tile map on the screen. This is that old double for loop from before with a bit of modification. Then we have two variables to keep track of the X and Y position of the test sprite that's going to move around the screen. Then inside the draw loop we do a few things. First we select bitmap 64000 which with an 8-bit ID is bitmap 0. Then we paste that bitmap onto the previous position of the sprite we're moving. If this is the first frame, it'll paste nothing at 0, 0, and it might cause a little brief one-frame glitch that nobody will notice. If it's any other frame, it's going to make more sense in a minute. We then use VDU27,3 to scroll the screen left by one pixel. 
an internal scroll counter gets incremented for our own internal use. Then we plot the far right column of tiles, calculating how far into the screen they need to be. Note that you can only plot whole bitmaps, not parts of them. So there is an amount of overdrawing going on on the right of the screen that wouldn't otherwise be necessary. There's then some logic to check if we've scrolled an entire tile, and if so, to reset the scroll counter and increment which tile column we're drawing next. And if we reach the end of the map, to loop back around. At this point, on the screen is the map, correctly scrolled with the missing part drawn in. We're about to draw the sprite on the screen, so before we do that, we need to mark out where the sprite is going to be, and then copy that area to bitmap 0. This VDU command only works with 8-bit IDs, so this matches up with that 64,000 in the previous code. After that, we can plot the sprite to the screen, and copy the coordinates for the next time around. And there we go, full screen, scrolling tile maps with sprites that move over the top, at a decent frame rate. The trick to this is the whole screen only gets drawn once, at the start. After that, it's just the previous frame scrolled sideways with the right hand end filled in to compensate. We've turned a simple but inefficient routine that stamps hundreds of tiles on the screen every frame into a more complex but also more efficient algorithm that draws just one column of tiles each frame. I don't know how well it'll work when there's more sprites moving around the screen, but as a proof of concept it's pretty cool. The next logical thing would be to expand this into something that is more like a game. Achieving this was one of those really satisfying programming challenges. It seemed difficult and took a fair amount of trial and error to understand what to do. This is why I do this kind of programming. Even making simple things work is a nice achievement. Now because this is YouTube and the algorithm loves flashy tricks, there's a bit of a trick to this that you're not really seeing. Don't worry, the code is entirely real. This is being done on the Aegon. It's just, it can only scroll in one direction at one speed. I'd need to write specific code to scroll the screen in any other direction. Also currently, there's no alpha blending, so the sprites aren't transparent. I've done exactly what Nintendo and other developers did back in the day. I've made a specific example that worked for a specific game, rather than a general solution to make any game. Mario ran to the right because the game was programmed that way. He couldn't run left because there was no code to let him do that. Come back next week when I make a Mario clone. Or maybe not. This is looking a bit like a sideways scrolling shooter really, isn't it? Now next time, we're going to need to look at sprite collisions and experiment with whether I can generate libraries using a particular C compiler that I'm using for the Aegon. I still have no idea what game to make, but it's looking a bit shooty. But we'll keep on procrastinating until I get there. Although is it really procrastinating if you don't know where you're going and you keep finding interesting side projects along the way? Maybe really the journey is more interesting than the destination. If you like the video, do all the interactive YouTube stuff and visit my website as well where you can find extra things that don't make it into videos and various ways to support the channel, all of which are completely optional. Just watching this video is enough. And on that note, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.